Okay, great. Well, um, looks like it's just a med so far. Uh, a med, welcome to the Skills Lab. My name is Scott Parrish. I'm a solution architect. Session is meant to be interactive. Um, feel free to ask questions, unmute yourself, or ask questions in the chat. Um, I'll post a message here if you're having AV difficulties, who to get help with. Um, and then with much further ado, I'm excited to introduce today's expert, Barton Dyson with MP Automate. Barton. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, so very nice to meet you. I've worked with uh, Blackball for about 20 plus years and a year and a half ago went and started a company that does a great deal of consulting work and process automation work for nonprofits. And we work with a lot of people on the uh, on, on the Blackball uh, platform. Um, so one of the things we developed was a way to join Financial Edge and XT uh, into the Microsoft Power Platform. We developed a custom connector, and I think that was one of the prerequisites for this session today. Um, and while BlackBot already has one of these for Razor's Edge, we created one for Financial Edge to open that up and let people create, read, update, and delete uh, our financial elements uh, from BlackBot the same way they can uh, make these CRUD calls to the uh, to the Razor's Edge. So, um, you know, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, if, uh, if if you'd like to ask any questions or even, um, you know, drive us in a few different directions, if there's something you're thinking about working on, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask and stop us at any time because we've got a small audience. But I'm going to start. I think I'll be able to share my screen, Scott. Let me try it. So now will you join us, brother? <laughs> All right, I think we have another attendee. Let me move this out of the way. Um, all right, so can you can you see my screen journal entry batches see that Scott? I sure can sorry about that Barton. yep uh, no, no problem okay so all right so let's get going so today what we're going to really uh, focus on is teaching you how to leverage our custom connector and push and pull data and uh, you know, from Financial Edge and, and get a sense of how we can loop that back to an app and, and get a sense of how that works. Um, you know, the good news is all the documentation at, at developer.blackball.com under this Microsoft Power Platform is, is heavily what we're leveraging. And so even though, you know, this was really written for Razor's Edge, it all applies to what we're going to be working on today related to Power Apps and, uh, and utilizing this connection. So, you know, one of the prerequisites was, you know, go ahead and download that uh, custom connector that NP Automate developed, something uh, we provided for free to all customers to, quote, democratize the financial data and, and connect into that. Uh, if you haven't been able to successfully do that and you'd like some assistance getting there, uh, feel free to email me. We'll send you my contact information or call afterwards to, um, to, to get some help. But, you know, we're going to record this. So just sit back and watch. Feel free to ask questions and uh, ask about other applications for this because I really just want to give you the art of the possible and show you how to push and pull information. First off, I want to give you a few ideas just to get us thinking. So um, some of the things that we've done today, we're going to be looking at journal entry, but you know, keep in mind that what we're working on could apply to project records or vendors. You know, maybe we need to approve a vendor the way we approve invoices and maybe request an address change or certain things to you know maintain fraud controls, uh, updating project information, showing data from other systems. So Blackbot has made it really easy to embed these custom tiles using Power Apps into the system. So it really speeds up the ability to do some pretty exciting automations, customizations, uh, eliminate extra steps or redundancies that you're doing somewhere. So this is an example where we're actually scanning through a list of maybe five entries, in this case two, or in some cases 10,000 entries, and validating that certain segments match up correctly and that they're okay. 
that a certain accounting segment matches a project attribute. Or in other cases, we're scanning through and creating new entries for the system. So these are all scenarios that could potentially happen. Uh, in this case, we're working with an organization that is uh, heavily grant funded, receives a lot of federal grants. These require complex allocations. Uh, and while this is still in test right now, this is a way for them to perform these monthly uh, indirect allocations against salary and fringe and other components directly within the system, while also maintaining kind of a, a list here of what's being managed. This also gives you a chance to see kind of a phone view versus a tablet view. And I'll show you, you know, I'm doing this intentionally to show you how this is what we want to work towards as we build today. Um, so without further ado, let's let's get started with what that process would look like. Um, if you were able to do the the upfront steps, um, you know, to get started, hopefully you're able to, you know, create a an app uh, and connect that custom connector to it. And that would allow some of the steps we're about to go through. But the very first thing we want to do is go into Power Apps to uh, produce this thing that we're about to display on that financial edge record. It's going to be right beside the other one that I built in anticipation for the meeting. We can show as many of these as we want. There's no limit to how many tiles we can populate with custom apps or custom BI reports, right? Works the same way. So in this case, we're going to rebuild this, this skills lab. So I want to start by creating a Canvas app. So you want to be in Power Apps, make.powerapps.com, logged in into your environment, and just go to create Canvas. I'm going to call it Skills Lab 3 because I've already created one and two. And again, I want to make it a tablet because that's just going to fit more nicely within the, the black ball tiles. And I'll show you some ways we can adjust that in a moment. Um, but, you know, you're going to have people looking at this on different size screens. They might even pull it up on their phone. So you want to make it as flexible as possible to uh, work across those different platforms. And, and that view um, actually supports that. So now we're left with a blank app, so to speak, that we're going to start with. Now, one thing you're not going to get out of me today is a lot of design work. So I'm not going to make this that pretty, but that's something we can, you know, learn a lot about. There's some great videos on YouTube, for example, that really walk you through some ways to really personalize a preview. You'll notice the uh, some of the ones I did had like the co the corporate logo on it, for example. So those are all things we can do, but. Um, App. Not be that creative and just put a title up there and maybe I'll center it just to get a little better off, but that's about it. So what's really important is the pieces we're about to bolt on. And what I want to show you how to do is when we attach this app to a record, a lot of times you may want to know which record you're looking at. Maybe not always. Maybe you're just using it to start a process. But sometimes you want to know which journal entry we're looking at or which vendor or which project. So one of the first things we want to do is create this app and um, and, and create the uh, the record ID that's going to go with it. So let me insert a text box. And we can call it text input. It's not really required. I think you can also use a label, but I always like to use a text here to show this. Uh, we're going to use this to test it first to make sure it's getting the value and then you can hide it later on as we're going to leverage that value that's being passed to us so once you've created this value you want to erase text input we can actually rename it just so it makes a little more sense to what we're doing because this is going to store the record id for the for the item that we're tracking um, you're going to find in a moment, not here as much, but spelling's kind of critical to some of these areas. So if you are going to enter this in, I'd do it the same way. Record, capital I, and then lowercase d. And I'm just doing that to kind of match up with something else. You'll see why in just a moment. Now, what we're doing here, and this is fully documented back on that Power App site talking about passing a contacts from the record. If you go to this Power Apps add-in section, it highlights this context value uh, clearly. 
where it tells you how it's passing that thing to you. So you know which record you're looking at when you initiate a process. So we're just going to define that. And the way you do that is you type param, which is you're basically capturing a parameter from a record. And you want to call it context underscore record ID. And close quotes. So I'm going to pause there and give you a second if um, if anybody's working on that. But that's one of the first things we're going to do because we're going to be able to capture that in just a moment. So it's kind of a nice starting point for us. So param. And then put in parentheses context underscore record ID. This is where the spelling is critical. It's got to be, you know, that way uh, for Blackboard to pass it, pass it in. You can't have a lowercase i or it can't be all uppercase, as you'll see in a moment. So if you have any questions, just stop me and ask. Now, the next thing we want to do is go ahead and start building the flow. And the order of these things that we're doing don't matter yet. Um, you can start building the app, but if you want, you can just start here and then jump to the app. So we're going to call this Skills Lab 3 again. It doesn't really matter. I'm just doing it a third time. But this time I want to choose how I trigger the flow. If you've worked with Power Automate at all and you've ever done testing, you probably use this first option quite a bit where you create something and tell it to run or you run it on a schedule. In this case, we want it to interact with Power Apps. So this is where the interoperability you know, really comes into play. And so we're telling it, we haven't connected it to that app yet, but we're just gonna go ahead and define some things and then we'll marry this back to uh, that particular app we're creating. So the first thing we wanna recognize is that we wanna capture that ID. We, we may wanna capture other stuff too, like maybe they're gonna input stuff like enter a from and a to date. Uh, for us to analyze, or maybe we want to capture the email address of the person that's clicking on the app because we know that through uh, through Power Apps, um, you know, security uh, through Active Directory. So if we want to pass other things, we can. But the only thing I want to pass at this point is that record ID, um, so I can use it. And so we use this handy tool within Power Automate all the time to do a lot of different gymnastics with data, with records, with arrays, values, and it's just called Compose. And it's a really simple little capability that we can do quite a bit with. One of the things we can do here is start to capture, and it's almost like capturing a, a variable, is capture a value that we're passing from the app. So you see when I click here, we start to see things pop up to the right that we're gonna use, and this will continue to grow as I build out this, um, this workflow. But right now, the only option is ask in Power Apps. And that's exactly what we want to click. It actually creates a new field for us. And I didn't even do that right. Hold on. Let me delete this and add it back. And I'll show you why. You could always do the same thing. If you delete the trigger that starts a process, it'll ask you to do it again. And this is a nice way to kind of um, reset everything in the system. Uh, for that connection. What I want to do is always rename it. So when it creates that value, it'll reflect that and it'll just make a little more sense. It'll be more readable. So you see this time now it says batch ID underscore inputs. So it's just more clear. Uh, so that was the, the change that I made. So make sure that, you know, if you need to delete this and add it back, you can, but you want to rename this to say something like batch ID and then paste it in. So now we have that value we have it in something where we can use it going forward so now we're just going to very simply respond right back to that power app get it to search and so we want to type in something like respond to power app or you can even type power apps and you'll see all the things that you can do with power apps which is really one thing once you're using it is respond and so now we're going to write back to the app that we just created. We want to see this whole thing round trip and then we'll add some more fields. Over here, you could just type info. Um, leave it in lowercase. If you do it in upper, you can uh, adjust it on the other side or call it whatever you'd like. But you want to remember what you call it because we're going to reference this in a moment. 
So I would just go with info and say the batch ID is. And notice we've added another thing here that I can select. So, you know, I could do that, honestly, but it's typically nice to go ahead and convert it to a string and make sure everything can work with it or to um, a number, you know, wh whatever we want to do. But in this case, we're just going to grab that value that I just composed. So it's kind of like a, a variable at that point, right? So really straightforward. We're, we're capturing a button being clicked. We're going to figure out what record you're looking at, and then we're going to respond back and give you that record ID. Um, but at this point, we'll be able to make other calls to take a deeper look at the journal entries and do more stuff, as you'll see in a moment. So I'll pause there. Any, um, any questions or um, just give you a second to see this screen. And then we're going to jump into the apps. So we're keeping it really simple. We just want to, and this is one of the trickiest parts, it's just getting everything to first off, grab the record ID, and then get this round tripping to work between the app and the, and the, and the automate workflow. So now what we want to do is um, twofold. We want to create, we've already created that record ID. So now we just need a button and a little place to see our result. So I'm going to add a button. Again, we're not going to do too much in styling. Sometimes I like to go and increase the paddings. If I'm going to do anything. I don't know why it's not letting me do that. And so then you just get a little more of a curved uh, button. And we'll call it Review JE. And again, if you want to rename it, and I'm going to come back and review these again. You know, just if you're creating a lot of this stuff, it'll be nice to rename it, but you don't have to. Um, you know, this is going to initiate a process, so you're not going to reference it. Now, what we're putting beside it is going to be a label, and this is going to be our response. So we're going to insert one last thing. And that's going to be a label over here. And so this is going to be when we write back to it, this is where that response will show that we just looked at. So I'll make it a little bit bigger. You got any text that's showing now? And so is that a, a question for us? I'm trying to see um, if you're able to read that, Scott. Yeah, uh, Michael just asked, will this need multiple flows per app or can a single flow handle the majority of the functionality? Yeah, so if you have, we've done both. So I've, I've seen scenarios where, um, or we've delivered scenarios where there's four buttons and each button is initiating a different flow, right? Uh, typically it's a one-to-one -one between button and flow, but you can write to a flow and then kind of determine which, you know, what button was clicked, right? Or what selection was made. Um, you know, it, it, sometimes it depends on the design. We see scenarios where before someone clicks a button, they're going to choose from like five radio options. Uh, perfect example right here, right? So this is actually five different buttons, but it looks like one button. And so they're all being shown or, or hidden based on the selection here. And each one of those is running a separate flow. So sometimes from kind of a modular management perspective, it's cleaner to let each process have its own flow, um, especially when you're doing complex allocations or something like that. Um, but the, the art of the possible exists to do it either way, where you could you know, have decision making where one button is clicked and based on the other parameters that are captured on the app, that could, that could drive it and, you know, maybe route in a few different directions within one flow. And that's typically just accomplished by using something like a, uh, you know, we, we kind of do the if then logic within Excel and what, I don't know why this is so slow, but what Blackball or sorry, what Microsoft likes to do is use a condition. So then you can say, well, let's see what this equals. And if it equals this, then we'll go this way. If it equals that, we'll go that way. Um, if you have like five conditions and it's more than just one or two, then I think it's called a case statement. Um, it's going to be under controls. Uh, sorry, a switch. I was wrong. 
uh, case of SQL. So then you could say, well, if they choose A, then run this way. If they choose B, run this way. So uh, answer your question is completely available for you to use one flow. Sometimes I like to break them out just to keep really clean uh, so we can audit each separately. If that makes sense. So, all right, we've got an acknowledgement. So cool. Um, so I've got this saved. We're back at the Power App. We've added this result. Now, what I want to do here is I want to have this kind of capture what we're writing back to it. And what I typically like to do is before I type this in, let's go ahead and connect this to the automate, and then it'll see that result that we typed in. You'll follow what I'm saying in a minute. So first off, you want to be this piece, what we talked about earlier, you know, a label and make sure it's this param context record ID. We're gonna call this field name in a moment, whatever you choose to call it. But now we wanna get this working. So from review JE, we wanna click this feature here called action. And so make sure you've highlighted that button. But again, we wanna define what happens when you click it. And so the old way was click on select and write a bunch of code to determine what happens when you click it. Well, this is the easy button or the easier button once you figure out all the nuances of automate and apps. Um, where we can now call this thing that you and I just, we built together and saved. So now we're going to say, all right, I want to connect this app to that flow. And we've got this piece across the top where it wants us to write in some more stuff of like, you know, do you want to pass variables or do you just want to keep it real clean and just do that? And that'll just start a process, right? So I don't know why that's not working, but what I've got here and I'm going to show you What I like to do, and I'm going to show you a view of this, I use text a lot when I'm just kind of like moving stuff around. And so, um, you know, if you're taking a value and you're moving it from one app to another, or in this case, I want this syntax. And I'll show you why in a moment, but I want to make it for mine, which is three. So I want you to type, and I'll give you a minute if you're doing this with me. In place of this, when it's created, you want to type or you want to wrap what you typed around this to say set, because what we're going to do there is be able to capture that response that we're going to write back. Result, skills lab three, run, and, and then this part again is so crazy case sensitive. The last time I did it, I spelled record differently. ID. So you notice I spelled that three different ways and it never accepted it until I got it right. So that's that's the key again. It's just so case sensitive, super case sensitive within um, within Power Apps and to some extent within Automate too. Sometimes when you're passing variables, so just always be wary of that as you're kind of um, you know auditing a workflow or something. That might be why something's not working, and it'll tell you. So hopefully you you've been able to get that added. And again, we want to set a result because we're going to get that result in a moment. We want to choose which one we're running, which that made the connection to for us. And then we want to tell it to run, and then we want to pass that record ID into the workflow. So we're doing all that with that command. Um, if we were just starting a process and weren't writing anything back to the app, then you wouldn't need the set result part. You would just have skills lab run, pass a variable. Um, I think it's always a good practice to pass something back, even if it's like an hour long process or something enormous is about to happen, you know, write something back saying, all right, we've started the process, you know, do X, I'll send you an email when it's done, but it's always good to round trip something back to the record itself. So the final, the last thing we need to do is populate that result field that I just mentioned. So now when I type result, this should say info. Now, if you don't see this, it's because it's not quite connected correctly with Power Automate. And, you know, you just want to cut that connection and add it back. You know, in other words, go here, delete this, click Power Automate, add it again, and then paste in that value. So a lot of times I'll take this and just do a Control X to capture it. Say, OK, it's clean again because I erased that connection. I'm going to choose Skills Lab 3. And then I'm just going to paste it back in. That step alone will reset a lot to suddenly make things like pick up that info if that's what you typed. So we're good. 
you know, this should round trip. This should show the value here. This should allow us to see what's going on. So the the keys were to make sure that this is defined. Uh, you want to make sure this is defined. And what's really relevant here is that this name is correct, which it created for you. Um, and this matches exactly what you typed here because you're referencing this field. You're pulling the value of that field out, which represents your ID, as you'll see in just a moment. So if you got there, and oh no, let me jump back. Just make sure you got this language, result.info. And this is set result skills lab run. So once you got all this, now you're ready to publish it. And this is really easy too. Um, I guess this is three. I'm going to save it. Now, what I find odd about Power Apps is normally it won't let me publish it the first time I save it. I have no idea why. It, you know, just like once you make two changes. Um, you know, I have no idea why, but just go back and change anything or change it and change it back and just go hit save again. And suddenly you have a publish button. So that publish should appear, but if it doesn't, that's typically your your limitation. Um, you shouldn't even need another license. Uh, I think I'm still using the trial within my internal since we do so much work in you know organizations, uh, power automated environments. So we've got it out there now, right? It's been published to the the Microsoft world within Active Directory within this environment. So if you're working in your environment against your live data or against a test system or whatever you're working against, um, you know, that's that's where you've put it. However, you're logged into Microsoft. Now I clicked that share button and you can get to it from up here too, because this is the secret sauce. This is what I need to be able to connect this back to uh, the Blackboard record. So again, we're going to go back to the my trusty notepad um, because I've got one of these from earlier and I'm going to show you where I got this, but this is the the tenant ID, sorry, the environment ID I need, the app ID. That's all you need. You don't even need this tenant ID. You just need that part. And we're going to bolt on this command around it. So you're going to have to type this, but I'm also going to show you in one second where to go on the internet to find it. And then we're going to pause and I'll give you a second to do this part. But what I'm, this is the last one I uploaded and one that we use quite a bit for other stuff that we're sharing. And so whenever we move it to a different app that we've built, we're really just editing the ID. I have two ands in there, but that's not really necessary. And then we're giving it a name, so I'll call it journal three. And you'll see why that works in a moment. So I'm going to capture this, but I'm not just going to make you um, read it from there. We want to go back to my applications and the system to add this. And I'm going to go ahead and add it here so you can see the language and then we're going to look at how we got there. So this is the one we did earlier and we're going to add one more and we're going to call it just to go with my naming structure, JE3. And this is where we choose to put something, whether it's a BI report or whether it's an app, where does it go, right? And Razor's Edge offers a few extra features we don't yet have in Financial Edge. Like you can put it on the home page. You can have a button that you click off the home page or an add-in button that you add to a record. Uh, the only thing we can do on the Financial Edge side is tiles at this point. So I'm going to go to the journal entry tile, but you've got it for projects, for vendors, for invoices, for uh, every element of the system. Once I choose journal entry badge, that's and now I'm telling the system that's where it goes. Now, what I'm pasting in here used to require quite a Herculean effort before Blackboard added this capability earlier this year. We used to have to upload a HTML file into a web environment somewhere, Azure, wherever, and then we would reference that from here and then go put that to the system. So it was a lot of extra steps. Blackboard really demystified that when they created this section under the Microsoft Power Platform, where you go to Power Apps and then Power Apps Add-ins, where I'm now. Because they're telling you, look, if you just paste in that value, we'll do the heavy lifting and then you can just make it appear. And so all you're doing is telling it if it's a tile versus a <clears throat> versus a button. In our case, it's always a tile. And then you're just going to pass this other stuff. 
So if you've got access to this page, for example, you can even paste this value um, and then just edit your app ID. And again, the tenant ID is, uh, is optional um, to make that work. I'm also wondering if I can, just now that I think about it, Scott, just capture what I just embedded in there and send it out. And someone would just want to take this and then just replace my app ID with theirs. Let me see if I can do that from Teams. Wait one second. And there's lots of other fields you can use within that documentation, but like I just added a height 200 because that seems to some sometimes work a little better. Um, but that's essentially what you want to get in there to get it to display. Um, you know, it, that's really it, right? Once you've made that connection and you don't even need, I'm trying to think, you don't even need the custom connector for that, um, you know, the extra piece, because we're not even querying anything. We're just interacting with a record. So that could, you know, be external data, for example. But now when I go into that same environment that we're working in, and I choose view to open up a journal entry batch. And so hey, this would be what, yeah. Could you reshare your screen for some reason? I'm oh, just yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, thank you. No problem. I have a habit of doing that, so I'm glad you stopped me. All right, so. Good to go. Back, back in GL. So go to whatever environment you're working in. If you're in a live environment, that's fine because we're not writing anything back. We're just. We're just going to a record and pulling its ID. So, you know, it's fine to open a posted batch. I'm in a sandbox, but <clears throat> any batch, click view. Um, even if you have it pop up on the right, it'll display there the same way. And I'm just going to sh shrink up these 163 transactions. And I don't see my value. That's so funny. It's always in things like this where you do it. And then no one, and then it doesn't work. I've done it three times this morning and it worked. One second. Six, one, seven. All right, and, and maybe one of you, if you went through it, is actually seeing it, but this is the result you should see. You should see that number being passed. Let me take one more step back just to troubleshoot on my side what I did wrong. Let's see what we got here. Sometimes it can take a few seconds for these things to refresh, but it typically works pretty fast. Seems to be accurate. Journal entry All right, magic. So, and sometimes I'll do like a control F5, you know, to hard refresh the screen. Sometimes that'll, like, if I just made a change to the app, you can jump over here, make a change, uh, and click, you know, publish again. That would immediately, by, you know, typically it might take a second or two, but it should pick up pretty quick if you just do like a control F3. Now, again, formatting wise, there's some ways to kind of tweak the size of it, but you'll see how much closer this, this, um, view does versus a phone view where it's a lot tighter. So if you did get this to work effectively, you should be getting the record ID and that's this thing up here. And that's crazy important, right? Whatever record you're looking at. Um, and the documentation talks about that context value, whether it's a constituent record, a gift record. This is how, if you do start a process, you know what record you're looking at. And so if, if we made it this far and you click the button, 
I think the last time it ran in 22 milliseconds. So the batch ID is 605. <clears throat> really, really straightforward. So we're going to take it one more step and show you how to add some more, you know, meat to this, so to speak, to pass more information and open up some other ideas. But the hardest part of this, honestly, is getting this part nailed down. Once you get a handle and get one of these saved as a template of how to capture this ID of the record. So when you click a button or when you're even showing information, uh, like if it's a Power BI report on all of your projects, but you just want to show data related to one project, that's a filter you can pass in to the Power BI report as you're displaying it on screen. We do it all the time to show financials against an event in Razor's Edge or um, you know, lots of very specific reporting just to show certain things against that ID. So once you have that nailed down, whether it's an app or a Power BI report, the rest of this gets pretty straightforward. And, and from there, the adjustments we wanna make is really just within the flow, right? Let's do something else to it. Let's pull more data about that batch because if we wanna learn more about that record that we have, we can't do anything just from the record itself. We gotta hit the API and ask it more for more information. So if you were able to download that connector, that should show in your custom section. <clears throat> if you had any trouble with that, I'm happy to help you after the fact. Um, or even you know maybe review some real world examples within your organization where you feel like some of these tools could could help and once we get to the list i'm going to type summary um i think we could also type you know journal entry but i just want to get just the headings the heading information about the je um, if i wanted to loop through at that point and get um uh detail then i can ask for a journal entries list and i'm going to get all the detail spit out in the JSON array and we can do some things with it. But again, I just want to keep it pretty straightforward to get you started in the process by just pulling some high level pieces about the item itself. And so now the one input for pulling summary and even a list is give me the ID, which we passed from the record, right? So again, I just drop it in and say, that's what I have, just like I responded down here for. Now, what I typically like to do, and this is kind of a, a best practice in, in a lot of cases, you know, a lot of times you may be adding something and you've got like 20 more steps. And so while it's not really relevant here, especially during testing, I'm going to add a terminate. And so even if I were kind of tweaking one element of workflow and I've got 40 steps after it, the process will start here, stop here while I'm testing. Now, it's important to note you want to remove it when you go back to live or when you want to run the process all the way through and make sure you get a response back. But just kind of a nifty thing, because I want you to see, regardless of what point you're using within Financial Edge, whether you're pulling journal entry data, projects, history, transaction distributions, vendor and invoice activity, you're always going to pull something and then you want to break it down so you can work with the fields. Because right now you can't really see what's in journal entry summary. And we accomplish that by clicking save and running test. And I'm going to tell this to run manually. Move that. And so we've got us wrapped against an app where we have to provide an input, right? Like we have to tell it what the ID is. So when we're testing it, it's going to pop up here. So I'm just going to type in that same value that I was looking at earlier, that record at 605 for test and I'm going to get a response. So this again should run pretty quickly. This may take a second or two to get the GL summary and it should be done. So each time we tweak this and again, as you're testing, I like to do a step, test it, step, test, step, test, because it's iterative and you know you're getting the right result before you kind of compound it and add something else. And so it's a good you know, practice, I think, with an automate. So now we were able to get this result. Hey, here's the stuff about the batch. We called the API against the record we're looking at. If we did it against a different record, we get a different result. But I can't just easily ask for these values within like my next thing. So in other words, if I were to do a compose and ask for the batch description, I'd have to code it. I wouldn't be able just to ask for it. So the way we get around that, and a really handy tool within Automate is something called parse JSON. So JSON, if you're not familiar with it, is, is XML's I guess, younger brother, you know, it's kind of a more advanced, more structured version of XML. And it's it's what a lot of information utilizes now um, 
to, to move things through. What we're doing here is we're taking this result, which isn't JSON, and we are making it where we can understand it. So the first thing I do, because all I have is the body from that response, I'm going to say, okay, that's the content. And then the generate from sample is going to be that payload that we just got. So if you forgot to do that, and I do that all the time, you want to come over here and click open link and new tab. And go back because every single flow you run is going to be audited here and you can see every step. And so you want to go back to where you ran that single step and you want to take that payload, that response, that body and tell the system what it looks like. And you do that by doing this generate from sample uh, to let you know automate kind of figure it out. There's times when it might miss one or two and it's, there's some ways to clean that up, but this goes ahead and takes that sample and turns it into stuff that should work. So now if you save it, and you actually didn't have to save it at that point, but now we've got access to these other fields and you'll see what I mean here. If we go down to this respond to power app and right now we just set the batches and then the batch ID. Now we could say the batch description is and suddenly all these things are here now if this was like an array and those 50 lines you're going to need to kind of pick which line you're working off of but this is just the header info so i could say well the description is the description and then let's take one more the um batch status so again, I'm just trying to illustrate the art of the possible here of how to you know, get to fields, whether it's project information, vendor information, invoice information, grab what you need. Um, once you get a little more advanced, you don't always have to do this, but it's, it's always best to parse it out and grab what you need. If you're not, if in this case, we're getting one record, right? Within, um, in some cases, you might be pulling a list of every line from the journal entry. So then you'll want to use some kind of looping mechanism like apply to each or do until, uh, which is in here to kind of process that and 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 work off of it. And then I'll say um, date modified. Just get one last field in, see a, a date. And I think this will do a date time, but we could always convert it within Power Automate to make it just a date um, without the time. And so I adjusted this, that should all pick up. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. And I'll show you how to fix it if it doesn't. I almost hope it doesn't this first time. But that's really what we wanted to do is we took that original round trip of just saying, here's the ID, which didn't even require API. And we bolted our custom connector and our API onto it. So, you know, if you're on a vendor record, maybe you want to pull data about the vendor. If you're on a project record, pull data about the project. Maybe weave it in with other information and send an email or send it to a data source or send it to teams. Once you have the data, there's so much you can do with it. Uh, or go back and update the record and mark it on hold or, or something else. So if we jump over to FE and I'm gonna hit control F5 again, just, I don't know if I have to, but I'm just going to. So control F5 is more of a hard refresh if you're already on the screen. We've got our same stuff. Now, again, once once I have this in practice and once I've, te you know, this is more for test, I typically will hide that field. So you go back to Power Apps and you mark that field as hidden under this uh, visible section, you know, and then you don't have to show it, you know, to your user because it's already working for you. Let me get back over here. See, and this happens a lot because when you add more stuff to a process, especially something that involves a connection, because I added this this FE NXT connection that I didn't have before. This is what you'll see. And this is exactly what I wanted you to see because I want you to see how we address this. And so in order to address something like that, and again, anytime you make changes, once you have this kind of you know nailed down for, uh, for a user audience, you don't want to make a lot of changes to the flow. But if you need to, and you're running into that type of issue you just saw, we do two steps in this very specific order first we break the power app from the workflow and add it back and then that'll kind of reset that because something's hard-coded somewhere 
And then we go to the Power App and do the same thing. We break it and add it back. But always do uh, the workflow first. So you go again to the Power App and you click Delete. And then it says, all right, well, we need a trigger to start this. So what's the trigger? And so again, we're going to go back to Power Apps. Um, the next setting is here. Remember where we passed that value in before? Well, now it's gone. And so we want to rebuild that. And again, all you do, and as long as you've named uh, this thing correctly, and this is why you don't just use it throughout the code and just reference it directly, you want to always call it compose because this is the only thing you have to fix in these cases. So even if I have 50 steps after this, this is the only thing I would need to do for a reset. So I'm going to ask in Power Apps, and again, it's going to give it the same name as before, so everything lines up. Hit save. And then I just hope all this works. So now we're going to go back here to my app that we just built, and we've got our Skills Labs 3. And again, I want to capture this and Control X. I want to cut it. And so suddenly this breaks because that's not working and nothing makes sense. Um, but that error really popped up because we added a new connection to FE and it wasn't all credentialized yet. It didn't quite have its arms around it. But if we come back here and choose Skills Lab 3, and then we embed what we had before in there, we just rebuilt that connection all the way through. So all those new connections to FE NXT and maybe we had a Salesforce or something else, all that is there now. So it's that's a value. We've got it. We need to make sure we save it. And we need to make sure we publish it. And I just want to make sure I, I did hit save here. So let's just try this again. And if you're on the record, you can hit control F5. or in my case, I have to control function and F5. And let's see if it bombs out again. Well, good news. Number one, it ran pretty quickly. Um, we also got around the error. So, um, you know, the, the whole essence of this lesson was to give you a chance to see step by step how to start from a record, capture that relevant thing about it, uh, and then push it back. So, you know, at this point, what we'll typically do if we're working with journal entries is maybe scan the records and look for anomalies. Maybe in some cases we'll scan posted entries and then we'll create deferred and capitalized entries off of that. So create new journal entries. So you've got endpoints in there where you could create a new ledger entry. You could create a project. You could flag something as, <clears throat> as an anomaly, so to speak, and send an email out to someone, um, provide a hyperlink back to the record. And, and, you know, even when you send emails, you have the ability to embed this link, right? And the only thing that would ever be different will be this number, which you've already captured, and you can always embed in, into these things. Um, but I think regardless of which record you're working with, this is something that, that you know, gives you the ability to um, interact with it and, and at least grab that record ID if that's one of the elements you want to work off of. Um, on the reporting side, we're doing more things like maybe showing financial data in on a razor's edge record or showing external data on a on a project record related to a grant or related to some other program delivery. So, you know, sometimes the reporting piece is just marrying together information uh, in that sense too. But suddenly if this were connected to say a project instead of you know telling it to uh, to work with journal entries and we were working off a project page sorry let me go over to custom choose that and then type project see we've got all these great pieces here to you know add an attachment to any of these records including journal entry uh, to pull a list of attachments to create a project to update a project to delete a project um, add notes um, just like the list capability, you typically want to start with search if you're trying to pull a list and work off of that. Um, going back to the journal entry component, you'll see journal entry create, right? So if you're going to build a new journal entry based off of something that you just scanned using our lesson that we covered, this can be a nice way to do that. 
Sometimes I use the clear if I'm writing back to the same batch or it's really useful for testing. Um, and then we want to add an attachment to the batch. You know, here's the the capability to uh, to drop that in and, and leverage that. Uh, and then again, we're doing quite a bit of work on the vendor side. Like people want to have good control over their their addresses, for example, and uh, maintenance of a vendor record, not let everyone edit it, but also have some ways for people to send those things on or have approvals related to vendors. And this is where all that stuff's available to you. You could put that this app we just looked at on a vendor record and let that initiate some type of approval process. Because once you get it here, getting it to say Teams or getting it to email gets real easy, right? Within Teams, you can add it to a channel. Uh, you can add a note or things like that. Uh, we do a ton of work with Outlook as kind of the delivery mechanism for approvals. So within Outlook 365, you've got ways of, um, there's sending, an, there's one called send an email with options, which is pretty useful, if I can find it, where you can have like an approve and a decline button. And based on that, you can determine what happens and then write back to the record and maybe mark it inactive or add a note or add a custom field that says it's been approved or declined or something else. And, and that's what's relevant. Once you get all these other pieces in place, and, and then these exist here. You'll see, I, I need to move it down so it's encompassing all these other pieces. But all these other fields are there now, right? So as we send this email, we can provide the detail we need. We can provide them a hyperlink to the record uh, and give them these choices and then respond to that. So a little bit kind of, not off topic, but I wanted to open up some other ways to, once you get it here, once you get it in a process, you know, then I think, in total, there's hundreds of connections to work with, whether it's you know email automation to survey management to um, a lot. So um, anyway, probably a good stopping point. Unless there's other questions that anyone wants to cover, again, I encourage you to send me an email or call after the uh, after the meeting if I can either help you identify some other opportunities within your organization and your business requirements, not just financial related. Um, but also happy to help you kind of get through this uh, this particular lesson. I think what I will do is stop my share. I'll just see if there's any other questions from the team. The chat looks clear. Uh, Mike Wait, is touching I touching something right now, Barton. I None here. Hear thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Barton, for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Uh, we this recording will be made available on the Blackbot Sky Developer YouTube channel. So if you go to your event hub, uh, you'll see a link to that particular channel. So uh, with that, we'll call we'll adjourn. Uh, thanks again, Barton, and um, everyone have a great day. All right. Thank you.